<laughs> Good evening, saints. Glad you can join us for our Tuesday evening Bible study. I pray the Lord has blessed your day today and that your heart is prepared to uh, study God's word together. Uh, appreciate the opportunity that we have to study the word of God. Amen. And to continue to do so in this way. Um, just uh, want to highlight to some points of prayer before we begin our time in, in the study of God's word. Uh, just received news this evening that Sister Letty Roach went home to be with the Lord. And so be praying for the family. Um, and uh, we thank the Lord for Sister Letty Roach. And I uh, and, uh, know that she fought a good fight. Amen. And so be praying for her family and be praying for uh, the church as we make arrangements soon uh, concerning funeral services. Uh, also, I had the opportunity today to go by and see Sister Yvonne Jones uh, in the hospital and, 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 and her, her health is declining, uh, but she's in good spirits. I, I've been, I was truly blessed uh, to visit with her today, pray with her. Uh, she will be going home uh, under hospice on tomorrow. So be praying. She says she loves Main Street. I want to thank uh, the church for all of the, the love uh, shown towards her during her illness. And uh, so we'll keep her lifted up as well uh, before the Lord and the family. Amen. And just some highlights, some other uh, prayer concerns that um, we mentioned in the past, but just don't want to forget as we've been learning that prayer is a means that God dispenses grace. Uh, on behalf of his people as we intercede for one another. Continue to pray for Sister Mary Bell. Uh, continue to pray for Sister Joyce Smith and her mom, uh, Sister Ella Bosley, uh, Brother Robert Murray's mother, uh, Sister Helen Coleman, continue to lift up before the Lord, uh, Sister Florian McGee's sister-in-law, Sister Rosetta Dawson's great nephew, Sister Bobby Johnson's friend, uh, Sister Jean Williams, Sister Kozan uh, Taylor's sister, Joetta, Sister Vanessa Connor's cousin, and Sister Sharia Johnson's mother. Want to keep uh, before the Lord in prayer. And then Sister Deborah uh, Jones told me tonight that uh, Pastor Billy Curl, his his uh, surgery, which was scheduled for today, uh, was uh, was canceled due to, to COVID uh, concerns. And so be praying for him and his up and coming back surgery, keep that before the Lord, as well as Sister Kendra Lynham's dad, Leonard Million, keep him uh, lifted up before the Lord. Amen. Okay, let's go to Lord in prayer. Let's, let's seek the Lord's face tonight. Father in heaven, we bless you, Lord God, that we can come before your throne of grace through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, that we do have a, indeed a, heaven, a, a hearing in heaven, and that you hear the prayers of your people, uh, that you, you hear, Lord God, as in a sense of you regard our request and you dispense grace and mercy to help us in a time of need. Lord, we pray for the names mentioned. Lord, we ask that you will uh, be a comfort and a healer uh, to those on our sick list. We pray, oh God, that you would also be a comfort to the family of Sister Letty Roach. We bless you for her life. Uh, Lord God, we know right now she's in your presence absent from the body, present with the Lord. That is our hope. Uh, Lord God, she's in her right mind, uh, Lord Jesus, as she's in your presence. And we bless you for that. Lord, we pray uh, for Sister Yvonne Jones. And, and Lord God, we know that her times are in your hands. And she knows that, Lord, and testify to the joy that she has in Christ Jesus today. We bless you, O oh God, just for your power and demonstrate it, Lord God, that, that when we find ourselves declining, when we find that we're coming close to to, to, to days or maybe even hours of life in this life, that we have a world uh, before us, oh God, eternal uh, in the heavens. And so we pray that you would guide the family and be with them. Lord God, we all know that all of us, oh God, are, are terminal. Uh, Lord God, all of us, oh Lord, uh, have uh, this day uh, brought us closer to the day of our own death. And Father, we realize in light of that, Lord, how we ought to live in the here and now. And Lord God, I pray that you would ever uh, so turn our ways, our eyes away from vanity and revive us in your ways, uh, that you will establish our footsteps in your word and not allow any iniquity to have dominion over us. Uh, Lord God, that we would always uh, focus on Jesus, who is our hope. We bless you for Jesus. And so, Lord God, we ask you cleanse us of sin. We ask that you will renew a steadfast spirit within us. Uh, Lord God, again, we pray for those uh, on our prayer list, Mary Bell and 
uh, brother, uh, Pastor Billy Curl. We pray, oh God, for Sister Ella Bosley, Sister Joyce Smith's mother. We ask, oh God, for your mercies to be upon Sister Helen Coleman, uh, Sister Florine McGee's sister-in-law, Sister Rosetta Dawson's uh, great nephew, uh, Sister Bobby Johnson's friend who's ill, Sister Jean Williams, Sister Cozon Taylor's sister, Joetta, Sister Vanessa Connor's cousin, and, Sari and Sister Saria uh, Johnson's mother, Lord God. We, we lift these up to you, Lord. And Father God, we, we're so grateful that you know us, Lord. You know us by name. You know our thoughts from afar. Uh, Lord God, that you've taken our tears and put them in a bottle. They're already written in your book, all the days of adversity that we will face. Lord God, we know that through many tribulations, we must enter your kingdom. Father, we pray also for our church, our financial needs, our property and parking needs. We pray, O oh Lord, oh Lord, that you will also bless us to be unified as a church, that as we've been grown in your word, O oh God, that you would bear fruit in our lives. We thank you, Lord God, uh, for your, your, you being the head of Main Street Baptist Church. Be glorified, we pray, in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Now we have a... A worship selection from Deacon Les Moore and Sister Athena Sholar.
thanks. Thank you, Deacon Les Moore. Thank you, Sister Athena Sholar. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks. Why? Because he's given us Jesus Christ, his son. Amen. Amen. I pray your hearts uh, were singing with Melanie to the Lord in that. Amen. Uh, First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 18 says, in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. I uh, just want to make an announcement. Hopefully I'll be able to remember to repeat it again after Bible study. Uh, next week uh, will be June the 1st, and I will be on vacation. And so looking forward to having Elder Wayne Cornelius lead Roger us. Cornelius. Roger. Elder Roger Wayne Cornelius lead us in Bible study. And uh, we will be going through the Sunday school lesson material uh, of the expositor, um, the Bible expositor. So we'll make sure we get that material to some of you all and you can follow along. And again, this will be a little bit of a change up. We've been going through Jeremiah uh, for a while. And so now we get to explore other aspects of the Old Testament, uh, deepen our understanding of God's word, see God move and the lives of his people in the Old Testament. And of course, that gives us encouragement in the here and now because he's the same God. Amen. Amen. Uh, so just want to remind you of that uh, before we dive into uh, the portion of Jeremiah tonight. I want to open up uh, the floor for any questions. You can type in your question. Uh, you can raise your hand if you have your video on. Uh, probably will be best to type if you do have a question so everyone can see it. And um, I'll do my best uh, to answer any questions. Any questions tonight? Anything I need to uh, clarify from this past Sunday or something that you may be studying in your own personal time? Uh, don't be shy. If you have a question, give you an opportunity at this point. All right. I'm assuming all minds are clear. Amen. Well, there are no new notes, um, but the old notes that we started on last week. We're in Jeremiah chapter 31. And what I want to do tonight, uh, a lot of this, again, is not on notes. So uh, Deacon Les Moore won't be able to put some of what I'm going to be sharing tonight on the screen. Uh, we're going to hopefully expand a little bit and do a sort of a theological overview of, of, uh, of the new covenant tonight. So uh, what we, we do each week as we've gone through the book of Jeremiah, we go verse by verse and explaining and seeing the historical uh, background uh, to the situation that Jeremiah was dealing with, with the Southern Kingdom. Uh, then we see the theological implications. And what I mean by that is how we see God moving in the Southern Kingdom and what he is after and humbling his people. We see uh, parts of that in our own life and the life of, of, of his people currently, how God disciplines us, chastens us, how everything is summed up in Jesus Christ. Uh, we're in this section from chapters 30 to 32, 33, of uh, the book of Consolation. Uh, this is a book of, of comfort in light of God's chastening hand upon the southern kingdom as he removes them from uh, their land of Israel into Babylonian captivity, okay? Uh, last week, we explored uh, verses that uh, addressed uh, God's promise uh, to bring his people back. Uh, but then, too, in the meantime, you have this sort of sandwich in between uh, this, this chastening, this discipline, this trial. And in light of that trial, they're to have this hope that God will bring them back. And so last week, we looked at the section. Uh, let me look at my notes here. I'm trying to recall this all in my top of my head. Um, well, let me look at my Bible. We looked at verses... I would say verse 15, yep, uh, to verse 18 last week uh, about the women who will be grieving uh, as a result of their children being removed out of Babylonian captivity, Jeremiah 31, verse 15, and, and how it says Rachel is weeping. Rachel is viewed as 
uh, figuratively as the mother of Israel, as a nation. Uh, and then we see how this was fulfilled uh, and the male children that were slaughtered uh, during the time of our Lord by Herod. And we, we saw that in Matthew's gospel, uh, chapter two, uh, verse 16 and 18. And remember, we came from that, we came away from that saying that even in the midst of something that's traumatic, uh, God will sum up everything in Jesus Christ. What do you mean? God will wipe away our tears. God will give us peace. He will always uh, turn our sorrow or our mourning into joy. We see this. We saw some scriptures last week uh, in regards to that. We saw uh, Je uh, Psalm chapter 30, verse 5. Uh, weeping may uh, endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. Uh, we saw in Psalm 126 that those who have sown in sorrow so reap with joy. So that, that's the theme of this consolation, that we, we do have to live, church, in this time, and as it was in the Old Testament, as it is in this time, we have to always live in the tension of the already, <laughs> in this world, already, we got to go through tribulation. Not yet is that one day we will not be in tribulation. One day uh, we will be in the glory of God's presence and never have to deal with any suffering or, or any tribulation anymore. Uh, Romans chapter 8, uh, I believe verse 18 says, I, am, I, am, I consider, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. Amen. Okay, so with that, just a little bit of a background. We're going to look at notes. If you have your notes, we're on page 68. And we're in a small section from verse 19 to 22 in Jeremiah chapter 31. And what we're going to do, we're going to springboard off of these verses into the section uh, of the new covenant, which you don't have notes on. And I'll make sure I get those notes to you after my vacation. Uh, verse 19 to 22, let me just read that from the text. For I, for after I turned back, I repented. And after I was instructed, I smote on my thigh. I was ashamed and also humiliated because I bore the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim, verse 20, my dear son, is he a delightful child? Indeed, as often as I have spoken against him, I certainly still remember him. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. Verse 21, set up for yourself road marks. Place for yourself guidepost. Direct your mind to the highway, the way by which you went. Return, O virgin of Israel. Return to these your cities. How long will you go here and there, O faithless daughter? For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth. A woman will encompass a man. So here, this section, as you see in the notes, prophesies the people of Israel repenting of their sins and seeking the Lord at the return of Jesus Christ. For after I've turned back, this is Israel speaking now, I repented after I was instructed. I smote on my thigh. I was ashamed and also humiliated because I bore the reproach of my youth. This inward and outward expression of repentance is a result of the regenerating work of the Spirit in the new covenant. Uh, scripture text that helps us with this, as you see there in your notes, is Ezekiel chapter uh, 16, verse 62 and 63. Thus I will establish, the Lord speaks, thus I will establish my covenant with you. You shall know that I am the Lord in order that you may remember, be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your humiliation. When I have forgiven you for all that you have done, the Lord God declares. Uh, Ezekiel 36, verse 26, 27, as well as 31 and 32. You have this the results that the new covenant will bring about in the hearts of his people. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. Then you remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. You will loathe yourself in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. So we see new covenant. What's, what's, what do I mean by new covenant? New covenant is a better covenant that replaces the old covenant. The new covenant 
is dealing with the coming of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. So here, as we just, I just read to you in Ezekiel 16 and Ezekiel 36, is that when the Lord saves, regenerates Israel in the future as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ or in response to their faith in Jesus Christ, or I really would say uh, in concert with their faith in Jesus Christ, this work of regeneration, producing the principle of new life in the soul, they're going to look back on their past behavior, their sins, and loathe their sins. Uh, they're going to be uh, ashamed, broken. Uh, they're going to look back and abhor their past life. They're not, they're not going to look back on their disobedience and, and boast or, or brag. They're going to be ashamed, okay? And what the Lord will do in the future for Israel, he has done now in the life of his church. Let me just give you a scripture text out of Romans chapter 6. If you can turn in your Bibles. We'll be in our Bibles a lot tonight. I'll try to go as slow as I can and repeat myself uh, as we go along. Uh, but in Romans chapter 6, and, and as you turn there, uh, Romans is a really, uh, it's a, uh, it is a book that is focused on the doctrine of salvation, okay? And Paul, in the first three chapters, chapter 1, verse 18, all the way to chapter 3, verse 23, builds the case that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and therefore all of us, all of humanity, Jews and Gentiles, are under the wrath of God. Uh, then he gets uh, to chapter 3, verse 24, all the way to chapter 5, how does God make sinners right? Well, he does not do it based on works, but by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Uh, we call that justification. Then from chapter 6, 7, and 8, we deal with not only being declared righteous by faith alone, but God begins the process of making us righteous. That's what we refer to as sanctification. Notice this, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 15. Okay. Paul makes a statement in verse 14, for sin shall not be master over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Uh, now that Christ's death has removed the sin nature in the sense of his domineering presence over us, his mastery over us, it's present within us, but it can't control us anymore. It cannot dominate us anymore. And Paul says in verse uh, 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not, no longer under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to the one to whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God, verse 17, thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you came, became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. That's the gospel. So when the Lord saved us, he produced within us a desire for obedience. Now, this now Paul is using slavery and mastery here to speak of uh, the unique contrast. But before we were saved, we were slaves of sin. Now that we're saved, now we're slaves of Christ. Verse 19. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. I have to use analogy to bring forth the point. Now, as Paul is writing this to the believers that are scattered throughout Rome, uh, Rome during the time of the Apostle Paul had recorded that there were about over 60 million people that were slaves throughout the Roman Empire. So Paul is using this analogy of slavery. You see this, and the slavery uh, in Rome is not the slavery that we've had in American history. Um, but the point is, is that you, are, you have to obey the one to whom is your master. And so he says, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity, resulting in, in lawlessness, further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. In other words, righteousness had no, um, uh, you were not under obligation to righteousness because you were in sin, right? Therefore, here it is, verse 21, what benefit or what fruit were you then deriving from the things which you are now, notice that, ashamed, loathed, abhorred? How did lying before salvation 
help you to be a person of virtue today? What, what sins in your past benefited your walk with Jesus today? Nothing, nothing. Those things uh, brought shame. If we could go back and do time over, uh, we would like to not repeat those sins that we've committed. We look back on that life and we abhor it. We're ashamed of that life. That's the work of regeneration, that the sin that we once loved, that we enjoyed, now we look back on and we're ashamed about it. And this is a part of my life in the past I don't want nobody to know about. Uh, and not because I'm trying to make myself holier than thou, but because that I'm ashamed of my life uh, before uh, salvation. I'm ashamed of the things that I used to do. That's what the new covenant produces. And so we go back to Jeremiah. That's basically what he is saying, that in the future, this is going to be the very statement that will come out of the mouth of the Jews. I abhor, I, I strike my thigh, I'm ashamed of the things that I've done before the Lord. And notice this as we go back, um, <laughs> how the Lord is going to draw his people back to himself. Um, uh, verse 20, the Lord speaks, is Ephraim my dear son? Ephraim is just a, another way of saying Israel. Is Israel my dear son? Yes. Is he a delightful child? Yes in light of the, the fact that all that Ephraim has done, all that Israel has done in disobedience to the Lord, the Lord is saying, you still belong to me. I must still draw you back to myself. Indeed, as I've often spoken against him, I certainly still remember him. That is a wonderful thing about the Lord is that um, uh, when the Lord chastens us, it's never an expression of his hatred towards us. God wants us for himself. That, that is the wonderful truth about uh, the Gospels, is, is that God, who is self-sufficient, self-dependent, self-fulfilled, uh, uh, in, the, in the study of, 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 of theology, we talk about the aseity, or the aseity of God, that God is self-dependent, uh, that God needs nothing outside of himself, uh, that God is self-sufficient, uh, God needs nothing outside of himself, uh, that God is self-fulfilled, he's happy within himself, God has all joy within himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God needs nothing. When God created the world, the universe, and man, he did not do that because he was lonely. He did not do it because he needed company. God does not need us, but God wants us. That's profound, that God doesn't need us, but he delights in us. He wants us for himself. And so he says, certainly I still remember him. My heart yearns for him. You got to capture this, church, uh, because what is true of sinful Israel is true of us, uh, that God yearns for us as sinful and as wayward as we've been against God, he desires us. He desires us more than we desire him. You know, uh, 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 here we are, we need God, and we oftentimes don't recognize or realize how much we need God each and every day. And yet God has established the means of grace, prayer, the word of God, fellowship, uh, for, our, our, for our benefit, for what we need. But at the same time, this is what God yearns for. He yearns for conversation with his people. He yearns to talk to you through his word and for you to talk to him in prayer. He yearns for his people. I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. Here it is, even in the midst of chastening, even in the midst of discipline, God says, I'm going to show mercy. I'm going to pity you. I'm going to show compassion on you. And what would that lead to? How would that mercy of God work? God's mercy, God's grace, God's compassions, God's forbearance, God's patience. Church works only in one way. He showers this upon us that we might turn back to him. That, that's, the, that's the purpose behind why God showed mercy to us today or was compassionate to us today or granted us favorable circumstances today. The blessings of God are not for us to become arrogant and strut and act like we don't need him. The mercy and the grace of God in our lives are to turn us to desire God the same way he desires us, that we yearn for him. So why did God bless you today? Because he wants you 
to, to, to turn to him and love on him as he's loved on you. So he says here in verse 21, set up for yourself road marks. Place for yourself guide post. Direct your mind to the highway, the way by which you went. Oh, return, O oh virgin of Israel. Return to these your cities. In other words, remember that the journey that you took from, from Jerusalem to Babylon, remember uh, the side streets, Re remember the intersections, remember when you turn left and you turn right, remember the way that you made it to Babylon, you're going to go back that same way back to your own city. You know, um, I remember growing up, and I was sharing this with the boys the other day, is um, I would ride with my dad, and, you know, back in the day, when we were, you, and I think he had a, I forgot what type of car he had, uh, but uh, you have the driver's seat, you have the passenger seat, and you had this little hump in the middle, right, the armrest, and I would sit on the armrest while he would drive and um, he would just drive around St. Louis. We would just go sightseeing and things of that sort. And, um, and, and I can remember too, in California, we moved to California. I joined, I, I, I enrolled in a new school and uh, each morning he would, he would drive me uh, from the house to school. And one day um, he, he took a nap, he fell asleep. He forgot to pick me up from school. And uh, the school was probably about two and a half, three miles away from the house. I was uh, in third grade, so I was probably around nine years old, uh, eight or nine. I walked. I walked from the school, from, from Windsor Hills to, to Baldwin Hills, right where my uncle's house was. And it was a, it was a subdivision where you, it was a lot of turns to get, it was like a maze to get to my uncle's house. And I, I remembered it. I just remembered where to go, where to turn. And I walked and to the point I knocked on the door and I was proud of myself. My dad woke up, he was shocked uh, and saddened that I walked home and, and he had forgot about me. And I was sharing it with the boys because nowadays when they have phones and, and, and there's so much entertainment in the cars, you don't really know uh, how to, you know, you don't learn streets, you don't learn landmarks. Uh, but as a child, and you all probably can testify as well, when, when you didn't have uh, anything in the car to play with, you just look out the window. And I couldn't tell you streets, but I always remembered landmarks. And, and that became the way. And, and so here it is, the Lord is saying to the Southern Kingdom, remember the, the guideposts, remember the road marks um, that, that you're going to come back to me. And it's going to be an unusual sort of way. The day that I draw you back to myself, you're going to want to seek me. Here it is. I've been sending prophets and prophets and prophets, and I sent Jeremiah. I'm telling you to turn to me, turn to me, and you keep running from me, but there's going to be a day. Well, I won't have to chase after you no more. Uh, my spirit is going to move upon you through the gospel, and you're going to turn, and you're going to come back to me, and notice the phraseology that is used here in verse 22 excuse me, of, of Jeremiah 31. It's a beautiful statement. How long will you go here and there, O oh, faithless daughter? How long will you turn away from me? Here's a father, uh, you know, the, 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 the compassion, the concern that we have as parents, God has that when it comes to, you know, that we have for our children, God has that for us, right? He has it for Israel. You're a faithless daughter. I'm your daddy. I love you. And you keep turning from me, right? For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth. What is that? A woman will encompass a man. What do you mean? Um, <laughs> the other day, uh, I saw on, uh, someone sent me a picture it was a number of pictures about, it was like a collage, uh, I guess you may call it, uh, of various pictures of women kneeling down, proposing to a man, asking them uh, for their hand in marriage. And I'm looking at that like, what? Uh, 
you know, what is the ma what what is, what is the world come to, where men think it's uh, flattering for a woman to kneel down and propose? Uh, it, it's a it's a strange thing, and the Lord said, "I'm going to do a new thing in the future." Israel, the woman, is going to come after me. Uh, is it speaking of, uh, of, 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 of in, in the context of, uh, of, of courting? Though the woman, Israel, is going to come after me, her husband, and say, I want, I want you back. It's, gonna be, it's not going to be the man seeking the woman, but the woman seeking after the man. That's the work of God drawing his people back to me. And as you all uh, know, you know, uh, Jeremiah uh, 29, you will seek me right? When you search for me with all your heart. Uh, this is not something that begins within us in and of ourselves. We don't have the resources to seek after God, but the Spirit of God will draw us to God uh, in the work of salvation. That's what we see in the future in regards to Israel. At this point, let me stop. Are there any questions? Any needs for clarification? Is this making sense to you? Okay. All right. All right. Got a couple nodding their heads. Okay. Good, good, good. Now, um, this is the part where we're going to open our Bibles tonight. And there's a couple of questions. And I'm going to answer these questions. This will kind of give us a, a good uh, sort of overview of, of God's purposes as, re, as, as it uh, relates to redemption right um the discussion and always the issues of debate are okay we have israel in the old testament we have the church in the new testament has the church replaced israel there's some bible scholars that hold to that uh is god done with israel uh is it two distinct peoples, the church and Israel, and that we're in the church age, and in the future, uh, God has a plan for Israel. And everything boils down to what I want to read to you, and then we're going to get into uh, the subject matter of the new covenant. So I'll have Les go to verse 27 of Jeremiah 31. Let's read this text together and go from there, okay? And we, we are... We all are Bible students. All of us are theologians. The question is, are you a good or bad theologian? A theologian means you're a person who studies the things of God. We study the things of God in the Word of God, right? Uh, we don't believe that there's any authoritative source outside the Scriptures that reveal to us God but the Bible. So all of us are theologians. The question is, are you a good or bad theologian? And the only way to become a good theologian is that we have to be students of Scripture. We have to observe what the text says first. What does it say? And then we ask the question afterwards, what does it mean? And then thirdly, we ask, how does it apply? So we're going to observe the text first. Verse 27, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. Well, I will sow, that's agricultural language, the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of the beast, seed of beast. And it will come about that as I watch over them to pluck up, break down, to overthrow, to destroy and to bring disaster. We saw that. We they they he has he has uh, plucked them up, put them in Babylonian captivity. He broke down the walls of Jerusalem. He overthrew the city and destroyed it. He brought disaster. So I will watch over them. That's future tense. I will watch over them to build and to plant. This is where we got sow in verse twenty-seven, plant in verse twenty-eight. So the. Uh, house of Israel and the house of Judah will be planted, planted where? In the very city he plucked them out of, declares the Lord. Verse 29, in those days, they will not say again, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, but everyone will die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. Now, there was a proverb, there was a saying going around uh, that, you know, the children, the father eats the sour grapes and the children, their teeth uh, are, are set on edge. Um, and, and this was a proverb or their teeth are dull. 
And this simply was used uh, metaphorically to speak of the fact that um, the fathers, the sins of the fathers come upon the children. Um, some of you might even refer to this as generational curses, right? Uh, you know, uh, even the world has this sort of superstition that the sinful acts of, uh, of our forefathers, uh, God will judge us for them, right? Um, uh, now, now this is spoken, is, is stated here, and it's stated in Ezekiel chapter 18. And the Lord says in Ezekiel chapter 18, you're not going to say this proverb anymore, but everyone's going to die for their own sin. That if, uh, if, if you grew up in a home, well, let's just say, where uh, your father or your mother was not present in your life, or they abused you, doesn't necessarily mean that you will have to commit those abusive behaviors. If you have an opportunity to go back and read Ezekiel 18, the text says that the son may observe the evil things that his father has done and think otherwise and say, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so can your past affect you? Yes, but it doesn't determine you. Can you be influenced by sin? Yes. Um, we can be influenced um, by evil. The Bible speaks of uh, sin being like leaven. It leavens a whole lump. Um, and so, and, and, and I think probably, Deacon, let's probably go into Ezekiel 18. Uh, let, let's go to Ezekiel 18. We'll give it away, Pastor. Yeah, my brother's on it. And, uh, and the more I'm quoting from, he's like, might as well just turn to it. Uh, verse 1 and 2. And we, we probably end up sitting here tonight uh, because this is so important. Then the word of the Lord, verse one, the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying the fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Why? Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father, as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins will die. And so he gives from verse 5 uh, to verse 9 a scenario of a man who practices righteousness. He does right. He lives a life of integrity. Verse 10, then he may have a violent son who sheds blood, who does all these things to his brother. He's the exact opposite of his father. Um, and then he uses another analogy of of um, uh, of um, uh, of a father who who does evil. I can say it again. And look at verse fourteen. Now behold, he has a son who has observed all his father's sins, which he has committed, and observing does not do likewise. So, um, this is a good parenting point here. Some of us do live by this proverb without knowing it, that we believe that the actions of our children when they get older is our fault. Um, we scratch our heads. We raised our kids in church. We expose them to the gospel. We pray for them. And then they go off and they do things that, that undermine all the instruction, all the teaching, and the modeling of example that we showed. And sometimes parents can feel a sense of guilt that they somehow are responsible for the sinful actions of their children, while in fact they were not. Uh, if you raised your child and you taught them and you modeled Christ before them, you disciplined them for their wrong and things of that sort, and they look at your life and they say, I don't want to live, I don't want to be I don't want to go to church. I don't want to, I don't want, I don't, I hate my parents. I don't like, I love them, but I hate the, their lifestyle. And, and they go out and do the exact opposite. The Lord is not holding you responsible for the disobedient acts of your adult children. You got to hear that. Um, um, 
the text says it here clearly that you can model a righteous life before them. And they say, no, I'm going to do the exact opposite. Or you might grow up in a church where you have unbelieving parents and they, they were sinful before you and, and God turned your heart. You're like, I don't want to be anything like that. And God turned your heart and saved you. So there is no such thing as a generational curse. Now, I want to distinguish that from generational influences. Um, is there a question? Yes. Explain reaping and sowing. Good. Okay. Reaping and sowing, uh, again, that's individual. Um, it relates to, metaphorically, uh, the spiritual law that if you sow to the flesh, that, that's Galatians chapter 6, you're going to reap consequences. If you sow to the spirit, if you do God's will, you reap blessings. But sowing and reaping uh, does not necessarily, it's more individualistic uh, than it is um, sowing into the next generation and reaping a certain uh, result. Because here in, in Ezekiel 18, the Lord makes it clear, it's a possibility that a father can model righteousness and a son looks at that life and lives a totally opposite life. They may not understand these are farming terms. So yeah, yeah. Sowing. Yeah, these are these are these are farm. Yeah, it's a, I'm sorry. I'm I'm thinking that you yeah. Um yeah sowing and reaping is if you do gardening, you go out in the backyard, you put a seed in the ground, you sowed, you water it, the sun shines on it. That seed that you sow, let's say you want to have a uh, a strawberry patch, or you want to have uh, some type of uh, vegetable uh, patch. You know, you're sowing uh, seeds of tomatoes, you're going to get tomatoes. That's what you reap. And the Lord is strictly, strictly using that analogy spiritually, that if you sow sin, you don't expect blessings. Uh, there are going to always be consequences for sin. If you sow a righteous life, you're going to reap blessings. I hope that helps. So sowing is like planting and reaping is like harvesting. harvesting. The fruit. Good. Thank you, Les Moore. Sowing is planting and reaping is harvest. All right. Somebody who asked that question? Yeah, sister. Okay, sister Connie. Yeah, good question. So um, so here, and I want to get back on this because again, uh as, as parents, oftentimes we can uh I, I remember. Uh, one preacher saying that uh, our, our children's decisions when they get older are not our decisions, you know? And so I would encourage you that God deals justly with individuals, okay? So you have that, you have that, right? Um, now, is there a certain degree of influences that we receive for how we were raised? Yes, yes. Um, let me give you two verses and I'm probably, probably close to, oh, we got 10 minutes. Good. Turn to first Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one. Now I want to distinguish between certain acts and mindsets. I'll just put that there and I'll explain it. First Peter chapter one, verse 18. Peter writes, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. First Peter 1, 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. Wow. Okay. Now, now, um, <laughs> um, I'm do my best to try to explain this. It is possible. And I'm speaking in regards to growing up in a sinful context. Let's just say that, uh, parents weren't not believers or your family as a whole were not saved. And parents can influence children in such a way and raise them in such a way to hate God. Right now, now 
the child has a responsibility after being influenced in that certain context, whether they will go forth and live that way. But let's just say, for instance, I think the analogy is always used sometimes uh, in the church when it's always a concern is parents who raise their children and put sports as the foremost uh, important thing in their child's life, that they're willing to sacrifice even church uh, worship on the Sunday morning uh, to take their child uh, to a football game or a basketball game um, and how a child can be influenced by what the parent promotes as the most important in the household. And Paul Peter's saying here, it's a futile way of life. I mean, if you're raising your children in such a way where Christ is not magnified, but everything else is magnified, like education, money, sports, you're teaching them a futile way of life. In other words, sports, money, and education won't get them to heaven. And you can inherit that. You can inherit that. Um, now, and inheriting that and being influenced by that and being indoctrinated by that, as you get older, right, uh, God begins to hold us responsible as adults for what we've taken in our upbringing and discern whether we're going to pass that down to the next generation, but we're still responsible. So I got this verse, right? This will make sense of the verse that the Lord is saying in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. I'm going to bring it all together, but I, I want you to deal with, with the point that, okay, I lived as a parent. I raised my child. I taught them the right way. So I didn't teach them a, a futile way of life. I taught them the gospel. They go away from that. They go away from my wishes. They go away from the things that I, the values that I, I sought to instill in them. Well, then they're going to be judged for that. Okay. Let's say from the parent who raised their children in a futile way of life, they put idols before them and not the gospel. They put sports, they put education uh, before them. Um, they, they put those things before them. Um, and then that child grows up and inherits that futile way of life and pass it down to the next generation. What does Exodus 20 say? Exodus chapter 20. Verse four, verse four. I hope y'all still awake tonight. Verse four, follow this. This is the second of the 10 commandments. The first commandment is you shall not, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment is this, and it's extended. It's, it's extended to three verses, verses four, five, and six. You shall not make for yourself an idol or, or any likeness of what is in heaven above, earth beneath, or what in the water under the earth. And this is going to be timely in light of what I'll, I'll be preaching this Sunday out of 1 John 5, 21. Little children, guard yourself from idols, right? Okay. So you're not to have any other gods. And if you do have other gods before you, how will that be manifested? You're going to make an idol. You should not, verse 5, worship them or serve them. Why? For I... The Lord, your God, there it is, Sister Ruth, you asked me about the jealous God. I'm a jealous God. Why? We're in covenant together, right? And idolatry in the scripture is viewed as spiritual adultery. And God's a jealous God. He yearns for his people. Notice this statement. Visiting, and we always stop short when we read verse 5. Visiting the iniquity. What's the iniquity? Idolatry. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, hear me now, on the third and fourth generation. We stop there. My father committed iniquity, right? And God's going to visit me with those consequences on the third and fourth generation. That must be generational curses. But you stop short when you read the verse because he's not dealing with generational curses. Notice the, the key part at the end of verse 5. Those who hate me. So God cannot visit you with the consequences of the sins of your parents if you love God. He is saying here that the, the parent, the father, has introduced idolatry in the household, 
and has trained and raised his child to hate God, guess what? That child will gonna grow up and raise his children to hate God as well. And God's gonna bring consequences on them because of their hatred. And so in other words, the father is gonna be held responsible for his hatred and the children under them, after him, will be held responsible for their hatred when it comes to idolatry. But, verse six, showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So there are some who think the statement here is replaced by the statement that God makes in Ezekiel 18. Don't say this proverb, a father's teeth is set on edge. I mean, the father uh, drinks the sour, sour wine and the children's teeth are set on edge. Everybody will be held responsible for their own sin. No, the point is, is that in the, in the rearing of children, in the, in the parenting home context, for the believer and the unbeliever, there's a distinct sort of weeping and sowing, or sowing and weeping. In the unbelieving context, it is possible for the unbelieving parents to introduce an idol to the kids and they raise and raise their kids to love that idol. I hear testimonies of NBA players who say that their daddy introduced them to sports and they've loved sports ever since then. That's all they live for and all their daddy wanted them to do. And so guess what? Unless they come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they're going to pass that idol to their next child and to the next child and to the next child. But God can break that pattern of idolatrous, of idolatry that, that manifests a hatred to God. He can save a child who's been introduced to an idol and say, I, I, I see that futile way of life and I don't want to live that way. Right. Um, but it's not possible for a believing parent. It's possible for an unbelieving parent to pass on idolatry to their children, but it's not possible for a believing parent to pass on the gospel in the sense of regenerating their own children. Salvations of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So we got to be careful that we don't misuse Proverbs uh, 22, I believe verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he gets old, he won't depart from it. Um, because you and I, we can't save our children. We can bring the gospel to them. We can witness to them. And we should model godliness before them, but only God can save them. And so if they leave the house and live a certain way, um, um, you're not to blame for their sinful life. I, I really want to take away the notion, uh, and I hear it a lot in sort of evangelical circles, um, raising how to raise godly children, how to raise a Christian. Um, you, you can't raise a godly child. They're dead in sin. You, you can't, I'll, I use the word raise spiritually. You can't raise them to spiritual resurrection. You can give them uh, catechisms. Uh, you can take them to church, teach them how to pray. And this is the thing that gets us scratching our heads sometimes because then they'll grow up and they leave Christ. And all you did was raise a sinner to be a religion, be religious. They never, it takes the regenerating work of God to save our children. I hope you hear what I'm saying. You've done your part. If you have shared the gospel with them, modeled a godly life before them, not perfection, but you modeled when you sin, you, you've, you, you're not going to be arrogant in front of your kids and uh, that, that, you know, and, and think there's a double standard that they can sin, but you don't sin. And you model godliness before them. And you, you, you plant it and you watered that analogy, but only God gives the increase. And so, um, so it doesn't work the same way when it comes to unregenerate, because when the unregenerate home, the parents are unregenerate, they're not saved, and the children are not saved, and therefore their hearts are already bent towards hating God. But in, in a home where there is a sanctifying influence, where Christian parents can be sanctifying influ influences upon their unclean children. I'm using the analogy of 1 Corinthians 7. 
where 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 you're where the, the, what I just said there that godly parents can have a sanctifying influence upon their unclean children or they're not their unsaved children do you all do you all understand what I mean by that okay can I show you an analogy analogy of that and then I'm done okay um, that as long as our kids are in our household, the blessings that God pours on me, they receive it. Okay. Once they leave the home, they're hanging on a wing and a prayer. They're hanging on your prayers. Uh, I believe most of my family members, I'm not speaking of my immediate family, I'm speaking outside my family, my cousins and aunts and uncles. I believe most of the reason why they're still alive is because of the prayers of me because god is just showing favor upon them because i'm praying on their behalf um, i hope i can find it it's in genesis um genesis chapter I know it's chapter 21 first, but then I need to look at chapter 16 first, okay? 16. Chapter 16 first. Okay, thank you, Deacon. Uh, I want you to follow this for me. Genesis chapter 16, uh, verse 9. I'm, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read verse 8 and 9. I'm gonna read verse 8 and 9 for context, and I'll be done. I want you to see this point. A uh, context here, you know that uh Abraham uh, took Sarah into Egypt. Pharaoh uh, saw Sarah was beautiful. God brought plagues upon Pharaoh's household because he took Abraham's wife. And this is almost like a sort of a, a mini sort of exodus because the Pharaoh wanted to get rid of Abraham and Sarah because of the plague. You see that going to happen in Exodus. And he gives him possessions. And one of those possessions was a slave by the name of Hagar. Uh, Sarah says, hey, the Lord hasn't enabled me to conceive. Maybe he's going to bring forth this promised child through my, my slave, Hagar. Does that, Sarah gets upset, mistreats Hagar, verse 8. Um, Hagar, Sarah's maid, uh, angel comes and visits Hagar because she flees from Sarah. She says, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai, right? Notice how you see this statement in verse 9. Then the angel of the Lord, or the angel of Jehovah, said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you're with child, you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, uh, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. And Ishmael, of course, the Ishmaelites are the Palestinians today, right? But you notice each time, it says the Lord, the angel of the Lord spoke to, to Hagar. The angel of the Lord spoke to Hagar. The angel of the Lord spoke to Hagar. What happens now? Because now Hagar is to go back home to Abraham and Sarah, and he's he's uh, he's addressing her as the angel of the Lord. That means covenant. Lord here is co it's a covenantal name, right? What happens now when when Sarah says after Isaac is born, Hagar and Ishmael can't stay here no more. Chapter twenty one, and I'm done. And you're familiar with this account. Uh, after Isaac had grown up, Ishmael mocks uh, Isaac. And uh, Sarah steps up and says, uh, they can't be in here no more. Get rid of them. And so the Lord in verse 12 of Genesis 21 says, um, do not be distressed over the lad, Ishmael, or your maid, Hagar. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. Isn't that something? That's, a, that's for another day of the dynamics between husband and wife and the husband being the head of the home and the wife is submitting herself to her husband. It doesn't mean, wives, that the wife is to be a slave to the husband. The wife has a mind as well. And she may have spiritual insight. <laughs> and the Lord says, you need to listen to your wife. She's telling you something you need to listen to. That's for another day. So uh, Abraham rose early in the morning, verse 14, prepared a jug 
and sent them off. Verse 17, he sends Hagar and Ishmael away. They're in a wilderness location. Ishmael is, uh, is, is dying of thirst and, and, and Hagar lays her son down. Nothing she can do for him. She wants to turn her face away from him because she doesn't want to see him die. Verse 17, and God heard the lad crying and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. Why is he addressing her as the angel of God? Because she's, she's not in the covenant home no more. She's not, God made a covenant with Abraham and Sarah. And soon as Hagar is out of that house, he doesn't address her as the angel of Jehovah, but the angel of God. Um, as long as the kids are in our home, they're under the roof of the Christian parent who's been blessed by God. And once they leave that house, they don't know Jesus. The only blessings that they're going to receive is your prayers on their behalf. Because God has no covenant with them. Explain the difference between the Lord and God. Yeah. The question is to explain the difference between Lord and God. The Lord there is, when I mean covenantal name, it's a relational name. God is just, he's creator. He's, he's, he's almighty. He's not covenant at all. Uh, God is the God of the nations in the sense that he rules them, but there's no relationship dynamic. But when the angel of the Lord went after Hagar, that is a covenant name that you need to go back. And as long as you're there, I'm going to bless you. And remember, right after that, he, he gives her, he gives her a covenant blessing. But once you leave the house, come up under the covenant that God established with Abraham and Sarah, he just refers to her, I'm the angel of God. It's not until you believe upon me, like Abraham and Sarah did, will you be in this covenant. I hope that helps. Um, we will, <laughs> next time, Lord willing, uh, deal with the promise of the new covenant. I thought we were going to get to it tonight, and then we, we, we get into some matters that I hope were, are beneficial to you and, and helpful. Amen. Uh, as we prepare to conclude our Bible study tonight, just want to remind you of our, our giving, our, our chapel giving, our tithes and offerings. want to encourage you to do that. Uh, when it comes to our three ways of giving, uh, we have our online giving right? And you can go online and we have our Gideon giving for the chapel. Want to continue to pay that down. Amen. Uh, and also, of course, if you didn't have the opportunity to give this past Sunday, you can do so on the online. Uh, you can mail in your offering or you can drop it off. Amen. Or, or you can give this coming Sunday. It's going to continue to remind you of that. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Also, uh, we have the church office hours, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, 10 a.m. to 3 Please be in prayer for the family of Sister Lady Roach, who went home to be with the Lord tonight. And uh, we'll give you uh, information uh, as soon as we hear from the family concerning funeral arrangements. Uh, so please be in prayer. And please be in prayer for Sister Yvonne Jones uh, and her family, uh, Sister Mary Bell and others in our congregation. Okay. Uh, that is all that I have. Amen. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. It's clear and concise and lord god it cleanses gives us wisdom it enlightens our eyes it's a light uh, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path we bless you tonight for your word and i pray that uh, lord god you would help us to discern how we can apply your word in our life lord just leave it here tonight with the thought that you yearn for our worship just like you yearn for israel you you delight in your people and you don't even need us, but you want us because you're in covenant with us. So help us this day. Help us this week uh, to be faithful in our prayer time, not, not in a sort uh, in a sense of any legalistic way or signing off of, of our little checklist of, of Christian duties. Lord God, in our prayer time and in our devotional time, I pray you would incline our hearts to you, knowing that you're a God that loves us and that you delight in us. And may that motivate us to seek thy face. Uh, again, be with the Roach family, Father. Uh, thank you for the life of Sister Lady Roach. Be with Sister Yaman Jones, Sister Mary Bell, 
uh, Brother Leonard Million and others in our congregation. Be with those of us, Lord God, on the Zoom uh, Bible study tonight. Lord, we don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we know you hold tomorrow. Keep our minds stayed on thee. Give us all an undivided heart that we might fear your name. We bless you, Lord God, for the night. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love you, Main Street.